Hey everybody! Hello. Hey, I'm David Schott. I'm the one that pestered you all to send the email and blah blah blah. I am the chair of the ADK GBC Young Members Group, which is uh, for those of you who aren't familiar and just heard about this through friends. Um, we're the uh, you know, hikers, paddlers, bicyclists, anything outdoors. Uh, we're the, the, um, the group of the Adirondack Mountain Club, Genesee Valley, being the Rochester chapter, and uh, 20s, 30s, but also anyone who's young at heart. So we organize this event, but really this is an event for, for anyone who wants to learn about, um, about uh, winter backpacking. Warm. Yeah, <laughs> staying warm. So uh, this is Irv Shantz and Dave Mundy, and uh, they're going to take it from here. Uh, if you want more information about our group, because we do a lot of outings both, um, you know, uh, both you know, with the group and just informally, uh, we do have a Facebook page as well as a uh, website. So um, everything's in the Genesee and that is out on the front table or just uh, however you heard about this, just get back in contact with me or email me and I can send you the group information. Thanks. What we're going to do is go through some of the basics and the handout will cover some of the information we're covering today plus additional information. As we go along, if you have questions of that on anything, shoot, Dave and I have been doing this now 20 years. I look at this, if you look at the little picture book back there, this is, you know, I only started when I was 50, you know, and I'm hiking with all the 30-year-olds. But trying to figure out how to improve your gear so you can take it one notch up from three-season camping to four-season, primarily in this area. If you go up to the Adirondacks, there you've got to go one step further because the first time we went up there, it went down to 30 below zero, and you're eight hours away from anything heated. You're trying to remember, what did I read? You know, so I'm going to try to help you through some of the mistakes we made and to gear that Dave and I have used that have kept us reasonably comfortable up to 30 below zero. So the handout mainly, you look at heat loss, radiation. Most of your heat loss is going to be from your neck and your head. So if you're overheating, put on a lighter hat or take one off, okay? Neck gaiter, same thing. But to have gear that can, you know, unbutton, unzip, in other words, try not to sweat. When you hike, hike maybe five, ten minutes. As you start to warm up, stop, take off a layer, put it in your pack, and, and hike essentially cool. When you get to a point where you're going to have lunch, as soon as you get to that site, put the extra jacket on, close up the cuffs, put the gaiter on, put the heavy hat on, eat lunch, and then you can again cool down. Conduction, well, if you're standing on uninsulated boots on cold ground, guess what? The cold comes right up to your feet. You read about Gore-Tex boots and all they're supposed to breathe in that. Is there any Gore-Tex under your feet? No. Then we'll cover the vapor barrier socks in that later. Evaporation, that's where you're losing moisture, through breathing or through sweating. And one of the things that you'll find out, water is both your friend and your enemy. If you get your clothes wet, wet clothes suck heat out of you 240 times faster than dry air. So if you're doing evaporative heat loss, it's a tremendous amount of energy consumed just to evaporate stuff. So you want to try to prevent that wherever you can. Uh, and we, we talked about like conduction. Put a pad under your butt if you're going to sit on a cold rock. And you'll see some of the stuff, and there I, I get closed cell foam. Uh, if you're in camp, initially when I started out I couldn't get good insulated boots. So what did I do? I brought two pads along and I'd stand on them when I'm cooking. So I, I brought insulation to go on the outside of the boot so that the heat wouldn't be lost. Then you put that same pad in the front of your tent vestibule so when you kneel in there, you're not kneeling into the wet snow or, or dampness. And if your air mattress, that is an insulated air mattress, something happens to it, you've still got a foam pad to go under your shoulders and your hip. So that's where something can do double duty. 
And the body is like a wood stove. Basically, if you think of it in terms of that, if you only put a couple little dinky-ass pieces of wood in there, you're not going to get much heat. And I can tell you from experience, I don't know why anybody that had never camped before would sign up for my first winter backpacking workshop. And one of the couples had, you know, those little styrofoam cup of soups for supper, and then got really cold in the middle of the night and decided to go into my cabin without calling me and turn on the kerosene heater without opening the ventilation up above. When I got there in the morning, they wondered why they had a headache. <laughs> but I mean, it just gives you a, a rough idea of something. On the Russian front, when you're pulling guard duty in winter, they would consume a quarter pound of butter before going out. Mm. Pure fat. It takes a while to digest, but the amount of heat that it generates in your body is tremendous. So that's why you think in terms of snacks and stuff you're going to take along, word of advice. If it's freezable, keep it on your body. Don't leave it in your pack. And it's handy to have like a little pouch somewhere close by so you can just reach in and grab stuff as you're hiking. Uh, now, your body heat can dry out clothing under certain things. When I was in Korea and that, and you've got cold mittens, you take off the wet cold pair, open your shirt, and put it in here under your arms. And then that would start to dry it and warm it up. And then you could switch periodically, because fleece will get wet if you're handling wet snow and that. We'll go over some of the clothing later. The only thing that equals warmth when you're outside is dry, warm air next to your body. The thicker the layer, the better the insulation. And in terms of that, convection. If you're hot, you take off the windshell and the air will pass through your fleece and suck away some of the heat. And the reverse is true. If you want to get warmer, you'll put a windbreaker over the top of your insulation to keep the air from sucking it away. Now, your outer shell, for God, I don't know how many years, I had a polyester cotton parka and pants, and they work fine. Up in the Arctic and Canada, no one bothers with Gore-Tex at all. They don't need it. Because one of the things you'll find out from Gore-Tex, other than the hype that they tell you about, they'll show you, they put over a pot of water, and you watch the vapor going up through it. See, it breathes. It's an excellent windbreaker. For that part, you'll be warm but it traps moisture. Think of it this way. Out here it's zero degrees. Out here it's 98.6. In between you've got a layer of insulation. Logic says that somewhere in here it's going to hit 32 degrees, right? What does vapor do at 32 degrees? It becomes water droplets and it won't pass through Gore-Tex. One of my buddies up in the Winter Mountaineering School had a drop out because his down, his uh, Gore-Tex jacket had a mesh lining that was sewn at the bottom and after two or three days he had a layer of ice inside of his jacket against his back about that thick. So something, you know, you've got to learn how to manage the different pieces of equipment. Uh, breathability, well, basically it's opening, it's venting, it's taking off layers from inside so you stay relatively cool. Dave, you want to go over some of the equipment you know, for stocks and foot gear, and I'll just start to hold stuff up? Why, sure. We'll go over vapor barrier socks. On the list that I have in the last part, there's Stephenson. He's an aerospace engineer. When you read his booklet about vapor barrier and everything else, what this basically does, you put it on your foot, and this beats a plastic bag and saran wrap. That's how he started, and we've tried some of that. And if you don't believe it works, put a bread bag over one foot, put your wool sock on, and on the other foot, just leave your wool sock. And at the end of the day, tell me which one is warm. It's going to be the one with the vapor barrier, because what happens when you sweat, your feet get cold. All right? Your feet are wet, insulation is compromised, and therefore you get cold. And someone said, well, gee, I put the vapor barrier sock on, and my feet are still wet. I say, yeah, but you got warm, wet feet as opposed to cold, wet feet. Then when you get to camp, you take the vapor barrier off, turn it inside out, take it to sleep in the bag with you, and put on a dry pair of socks at night to go to bed. Yes, the gators, which 
those are, happen to be Gore-Tex, ORs. What's interesting about gators, uh, I've actually fallen into a stream and I had all Gore-Tex on. And with those particular gators, and I, I didn't get wet at all. My feet didn't get wet, but my clothes underneath did not get wet. Of course, I didn't start swimming in the stream. I got out as quickly as I could. But they do work, and they do work well. And they're easy to take up, put on, and take off. And these fit under your boot. You can adjust them. The Velcro, they close up really nice. And I had the same thing as Dave had. I was the last one on, on the trip. Everybody across the stream on the log, I do. And I get to the end, it goes bang, down and I go. And, you know, it, it helps keep the foot dry. Plus, it keeps the snow off your laces and all of that so you can open it up. Two items, especially if you get up into the mountains or in any of the places where there's uh, wind coming. Uh, one of the first trips I did down in the Adirondacks, Avalanche Pass, the wind was coming at 20 below zero. I blinked my eyes and they froze shut. <laughs> you know, it's not funny. I mean, at the time, it was like, wow, I don't believe this could happen. So a pair of goggles, especially if you're up on the mountaintops, and this is a lifesaver. You might laugh at it. I don't know if they're still available or not, but all skin is protected and insulated. Outer mittens. Um, one thing, uh, if you're going to do some mountain climbing, you may want to try the old Inu thing where you actually have a string around your neck and I got tie it on each one like this. So what happened is if uh, the expedition up to Everest where those 14 people died, one guy's, one of his mittens blew off and his hand was exposed uh, to the elements and lost his hand uh, due to frostbite. So you can sew in a shoelace and a cord lock. And those, that does add insulation to your gloves or your mittens on, once you put these on. So it uh, protects your hands. And nice. this is outdoor research. What they do, they have an inner fleece mitten that is Velcroed in that you can take out and change. I don't have those. <laughs> I just got the outer mitt. No. <laughs> <laughs> but you can also do the gloves, too. Uh, boots, again, depending on where you're going. Uh, for a long time, I had a hard time getting boots that would fit me with insulation, so I would stand on one of the foam pads and I got to camp. But this pair from Cabela's goes down 20 below zero. Uh, I never had to worry about it. It's been super warm, never had cold feet, but they're heavy. And then one of the guys in the Adirondack Mountain Club outgrew his um, mucklucks and said, would I like them? And this is like hiking in your bedroom slippers. Uh, marvelous. Uh, they breathe. The, the moisture goes out. They have a built-in gator. This goes up to almost your knee, crosses with rawhide, and it's wonderful. The only thing is, it doesn't work when it gets above 25. Wait, amen. Yeah. Well, what the natives would do when they had the muckluck, they have seal skin bladders that they'd go in. But what most of the natives do now, they go to the farm store and buy the tingly farm rubbers, the real thin ones, and put the uh, felt liner in that and use that. But, and here's pretty much a standard type Cubs snowshoe, but you want to get them with good grippers and cleats, because if you're going somewhere up in the Adirondacks, anybody that's got some steep terrain, these plastic sheets are slippery, trust me. We were coming down off, I think it was Marcy, and there was a steep pitch. It took me like 45 minutes to get up it. Coming down, like I remember the old telemark type ski, the old fashioned ski with the wooden skis. As I'm coming down the slope, I said, oh, hey, this is about like, and I slide one foot in front, what like this, I go to turn this way, and I turn that way, going down the mountain. It was, it was a lot of fun. I didn't hit any trees, but. <laughs> and then, again, a variety of headgear. Something like this is super light if it's warm out. Uh, the beanie might be what you wear in your sleeping bag for extra warmth. I don't know if they even still make these. Jim Whitaker from the Everest Expedition made this one. It was the nicest hat. It's got a peak visor down, ear cover, uh, and heavy fleece inside. So there you have to pick something that 
feels comfortable to you. And then you've got, and this is good for two things. When you put it over, you can have cover like this, but at night when you're in your sleeping bag, so you don't stick your head in your bag, you put it over your nose and your mouth, and that lets you breathe in warm, moist air. Otherwise, if you can bring in cold, dry air, it sucks heat out of you and moisture. And gloves, again, a variety of them. One is a, a synthetic knit. The others are polar fleece, and I love the polar fleece ones. The, the knit one is good, you know, like for operating stoves and stuff like that. Remember, don't pick up a fuel bottle if it's way below freezing because the gas can be at the outdoor temperature and you can stick to the fuel bottle. Your camp jacket. Oh, yeah. What a stuff to say. This is marvelous insulation. This little pack here holds. Here, pull out the rabbit. <laughs> He's going to show you one that's even better yet. That's what you'll have in camp. It compresses down nicely and gives you all the extra warmth you'll want, and it's not uh, heavy. There's one, one of the simple pads that I made up that's right in the back of your pack or could fit on top. And then I carry two sets of underwear. A medium weight synthetic, this is by dual fold. That's the one I use most of the time. It's got a neck opening. Uh, the reason I take two, there, there are two reasons. Well, we've been up the Adirondacks when it's gone up to like 50 degrees. And this is way the hell too hot. And you can switch then to a lighter weight one or if it gets super cold, you put the lighter weight one on, the medium weight one, and then you've got extra warmth. Underwear, again, briefs in that, synthetic. And this is like a Cool Max t-shirt from L.L. Bean. No cotton, absolutely forget cotton. Uh, Peter Fish, the main ranger up in the Adirondacks for 15 years, said all the best dressed cadavers I hobbled out of the mountains. We're all in Levi's, cotton flannel shirts, and cotton sweatshirts, and that tells you anything. So forget cotton. It, it, it's supposed to keep you cool, right, in summer? That's why you wear it. Well, in winter, it does the same thing. And socks, again, make sure you have at least one extra pair. Because like Dave was saying, you go in the water, you fall, you better have something dry to put on. And I usually have a lighter weight sock to put on when I'm in the sleeping bag. So I've got like a uniform layer of insulation all the way around. And then in camp, for extra warmth, on your legs, for instance, this is a polar fleece like sweatpants. I couldn't find the one that has full side zippers, but if you get one, full side zippers are nice because then you can put it down without taking your boots off. And this is my old standard. I've had this for 25 years, summer, winter. It's just wonderful because it's, it's stretchy and it's a 200 weight, so it gives you nice protection under a windbreaker of that. And here's something most of you probably aren't familiar with. It's a vapor barrier shirt. Uh, what it does, it keeps your perspiration from going into your insulation. However, Unless you're on a flat ground, like up the boundary waters, with the sleds in that, or the Antarctic, we don't have a pack on your back. This will do its job, but you'll be uncomfortable. In other words, if your back sweats, guess where it goes? Down your butt. <laughs> but when you get to camp, before you put the down jacket on, you, you know, maybe take off a, a, a shirt, put this on. And then that allows your body heat gradually to slowly dry out the undergarments without compromising the down. Uh, Stephenson's has got these, and they're, I don't think, about $30. And then as far as clothing, again, this happens to be a Gore-Tex parka with, you know, hood and all the bells and whistles and zippers and that. But you can also get, just 
just like I say, a plain uh, poly cotton that'll work unless you're going to have rain. Full side zippers on the legs are excellent because if you start to overheat, you're going up a, a, a steep pitch, you open up the zippers all the way, and it's like hiking in your underwear. When you're going down the hill, though, even if you're warm, zip them up. Because <laughs> if you slip and fall, they pack a lot of snow in there. <laughs> Let's see what else we got on the list. Oh, something like this, especially up in the mountains. You usually don't need it around here, but ice creepers. Some form of chain or something that goes under your boot. If we have any questions as we go along, feel free to just raise your hand and shout. We've covered most of the underwear, everything else. Like I say, yeah. Okay, so we just talked about the crampons, icebreakers that you call them. I've heard that yak tracks and like the running equivalent are a no-no, especially on mountainsides and that kind of stuff. Well, I don't know. The, the lack, uh, those tracks and that, they're just they're like a coil. They work on ice. This digs in. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, yeah. Now, what they've done too, if you're really going up into, into the high peaks of climbing, then they've got full crampons that'll have, uh, many will have like, like two fangs in front. So you're going up ice faces, you can just purchase on that. This will get you on icy trails fairly well. I've used them only a few times. Uh, up in New Hampshire when I was there, it was all clear ice. I put those on, and at that time my daughter was only about a year old, and she was in my backpacks. But the ice creepers, they work. Uh, I would say as you get in, get used to doing stuff in the Finger Lakes area and that first. Another thing that I've always done, and my neighbors must think I'm crazy, I would go out in the backyard and try all my equipment, notebook, flashlight, thermometer. Did it work or not? If it didn't, I'd just open the door and go inside the house. But I started out with a 40 degree rectangular LL bean bag for winter camping. Does that tell you anything? <laughs> and then you start to figure out what does it take to go that extra 20 degrees or so. And you start to note that, for instance, if you wear the fleece in the sleeping bag, you're good for another 15, 20 degrees on top of your long job. Then I thought I'd be smart. I got a fleece liner bag. And I put that in the LL Bean bag and I crawled in with the fleece outfit. Wrong. You're Velcroed into the bag and can't move. <laughs> <laughs> and when nature calls, you're trying to say, what the hell's the damn zipper, you know, and you can't get out, you're stuck. So by the time I did that and then put a, a, a nylon running suit over the top, I said, why don't you just get a better bag? <laughs> Lighter, it's cheaper, it's easier. So that'll give you some idea there. With the, uh, with the icebreakers, do you need like, boots with crampon grooves, or can they go on any boots? Uh, there you'll have to check with one of the mountaineering shops. Probably they're going to go on things like a uh, hard plastic boot, like a lot of the mountaineers use. Uh, and that's a whole different field that I haven't gotten into. So I can speak to that. Pardon? So uh, for 90% of trails, especially if you're going out where it's mostly snow, where sometimes it's packed down, where you don't really need snowshoes. Um, the best thing is micro spikes. They're really easy. They catch well. They don't, uh, they're not very heavy. And they, they run about 60, 70 bucks, but it's well worth it. I highly recommend them. Um, a lot of us refer to them as ass savers. And then for that other 10%, if you actually like, you know, climbing high peaks, and you get to places where it is really icy, sheer ice, or you need a little bit of you know stepping into it, um, then there's two types of crampons. There are the kind that are made for um, for your normal hiking boots with flexible rubber soles, and there are also ones made for plastic um, hard shell mountaineering boots. And when you go to buy those, you know the, you'll just buy the type that's right for what you're using. Thank you. Now we started to look at sleeping bags and that. I don't think we can cover tents. You want to do something on the tents then, Dave? Yeah, uh, well, with tents, everybody seems to think that you have to go out and buy a new tent strictly for wintertime. You could use your three-season tent um, for uh, winter camping. 
especially if you have enough ventilation like uh, one for the top, or you can ventilate it so you can zip it down uh, so it's a little on the top side so you can ventilate some of the, like the carbon monoxide coming from your, if you're using a backpack candle. I would highly recommend, because if any of you have done a lot of camping in the winter time, you give off a lot of water vapor and it all condenses on the inside of your tent. So you bump the side of your tent and all that comes Frost. down. Frost. Snow. Frost. Uh, the way to eliminate that is this will eliminate all that condensation inside the tent. You can either use one or two candles. They usually last about five hours, which is good enough. And also, I might add, you put it in the tent before you're going to bed, and I'll actually increase the temperature inside your tent of approximately 10 to 15 degrees. So that's something you may want to consider, is actually buying an inexpensive backpack candle and stick it in the tent. Some people don't like it because they don't like all that light at night. It's well, even just getting dressed with it on or undressed, it, it warms the tent up. And I've had on one of the little backpacking west wind hoop tents, 20 degrees. And that's a pretty nice trade off. And it lasts, you know, with a candle like that, like I said, lasts five hours, which uh, is far better than a flashlight, for instance, and using it, especially under cold temperatures. So, and then when you, when you find, you want to figure out where you want to camp, using your snowshoes to pat down your, where your tent site's gonna be so that it's nice and flat and it's and your your tent will be level where if you don't do that then what happens is you're gonna get lumpy spots. And uh, that is and also have a path going outside your tent wherever you want to do your business out in the woods so that you're not coming up to here in deep snow. So you don't have to put your snowshoes back on. And um, also you may want to use what they call ice axe, uh, ice sticks like this one. Uh, in most cases, though, if you're if you're not going up in the mountain type, you may just have use regular stakes, but actually uh, put snow and water, and it'll freeze around the tent stakes. And notice the color. Yes, we can find them. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you can do do dead men, where you take a branch or a stick and you got rope from your tent to anchor because a lot of these freestanding tents, if you leave it for the day to go somewhere and you get a high wind, you don't have a lot of snow, your tent can move from where it is. And something like this is just buried in the ground and then the rope goes up to the tent to anchor it. One of the things I've done with the tent is take a piece of closed cell foam and put it in the vestibule. That way when you kneel to go into the tent, you kneel on something that's warm as opposed to on the cold snow on that. Now as far as pads, air mattresses, strictly as air mattresses, are out because they just suck heat right away from you. But you go to something like a thermorest or that where they've got closed cell foam in there, or if you do the luxury of one of Stephenson's bags, his is an air mattress lined with quality down and you, do, you don't blow it up, you have a bellows so you don't put moisture in it. And that makes one of the lightest combinations. His bags are wonderful, but they're frightfully expensive. So if you don't use them all the time, you know. Uh, Will Steiger went up to the, I forgot it was the Arctic or the Antarctic, probably the Antarctic. Both. He went to both. Did he? Yeah. Well, anyway, he took the latest in modern gear, vapor bear, not vapor bear, but regular, you know, synthetic uh, Gore-Tex, the whole nine yards. By the end of the expedition, the bag was up to 50 pounds heavier than it started <laughs> based on ice. They were starting to put two men per bag to try to keep warm. The Russian group went and they bought Stephenson bags, which had a vapor barrier built into it and a down mattress. Their system weighed six pounds at the beginning of the trip and six pounds at the end of the trip because you got no moisture into it. See, the biggest thing is if you go out for only one night, it's not a major problem. But if you go out for two, three nights and you accumulate moisture and it freezes, and your loft is compromised, you get cold. Now, one of the things, I've got this whole setup here. This little package here, and that's probably what I would recommend. Uh, they've got them at Camp Walk, vapor barrier. I think it's under $30, and they've got two different sizes. What it does, you crawl into it. Yes, yeah, inconvenient to get in. You sort of get into your feet, and then lift your butt up and pull it up. You know, it's got no zipper or anything else. It's got a draw cord at the top, but if you're cold, 
it's very hard to reheat a cold body. Like with hypothermia, they'll tell you you've got to gradually warm the person up and so on, get something warm and that's still hot. But if you can stay warm, that's your first plus. But if you get into a bag, and I had this when I was out hunting with my brother one time, I got cold, it's 40 degrees, I got a 20 degree bag, it should be plenty warm. But it wasn't warming me enough for, for doing it. I went out to the truck, got the vapor barrier, stuck it in there, wrapped it around me, tied it around my neck, and in about 15 minutes my temperature came back up, I loosened it, I was good for the whole rest of the night. So that, if you have to buy one piece of equipment, that would be the one I would look at for upgrading your sleeping bag. Uh, another thing on the bigger sleeping bags, you might consider some form of compression stuff sack. They show them yours. Okay. This is like the magician with the rabbit. When we first went camping, he opened up his sleeping bag. Well, this this particular sleeping bag goes down to minus thirty. Is that down? No. This is all called synthetic. It's a synthetic. The trouble with down is, if it gets wet, you're in trouble. If this gets wet, you're not in trouble. And it's a lot easier to dry. Once down gets wet, it stays wet. It's very hard to dry even in the uh, even in the summertime, late summer. So this is what a compression sack looks like. I didn't practice. There's a disadvantage to these particular type of sleeping bags that go down so low. And the big the reason bag. that they're tough is, is because when it's minus 20, try and put that bag back in this stuff sack. <laughs> because you can't use mittens. you got to use something. So your hands are going to get cold. So that's a disadvantage to this particular type of bag. The other thing to remember is always put a plastic bag around your sleeping bag and your like down jacket. You do not want to compromise that by pulling it. You know you always have a bag. But look at the size of that pump. Now what's the advantage of a bag like this? And I might have, I've owned this now for 30 years. And it's still real good. Um, it has two zippers. There's an in zipper and there's an out zipper. So it keeps the air, keeps cold air from coming in inside the bag. It also obviously is a mummy bag where you put your head in here and uh, zip it up. Now because of the fact that uh, you're in the winter time, sometimes uh, it's not real bad out, but I use this even in the tent because of the condensation problem where you get the snow. This was uh, designed by REI way back when. It's called Cyclops. In fact, won several awards. It was designed that you could sleep outside in a good sack, and it zips where you can unzip it so you can put your hand out and cook and still be in the bag. Um, it also has a hood. Let's see. And a snorkel. <laughs> Yeah, of course, you're out. It's 30 below zero. Yeah. Uh, the idea is, if you're going to sleep outside, don't sleep under a tree, because all that snow, you know, wind and so on, all that snow will fall on you, and some of it might get inside here. So the best thing to do is. Uh, Did you get a draft collar on that, Dave? What's that? Draft collar on the neck? Yes, there is a draft collar on the neck inside. What you can do with a 20 degree bag is take like your flannel shirt like I'm wearing and wrap it around your neck and what that acts like a cork in a bottle because as you move in your sleeping bag the air will want to billow out and that's why they put a draft collar on so it traps the air inside. So you wrap a shirt or something around your neck when you do your sleeping bag and you'll find that you are immediately warmer. So is that a vapor barrier, much like this? This is a, a bivy sack. And what I did after I saw Dave, I sent it back to REI, and they modified the length of the zipper, and they sewed in essentially a snorkel. And what that can do, depending on the weather, you can draw it down to a very small opening. And like I said, what I did is take the neck gaiter, and you put it over your mouth and nose, so as you breathe out, your head doesn't breathe into the bag. Otherwise, you're putting all that moisture in the bag itself. So that's called a baby sack? Baby sack, yeah. You can also do it with a space blanket when you're starting out. 
as far as expensing that. But if you do the space blanket or that over the top that doesn't breathe, you better have a vapor barrier liner inside. You're going to find out that you're going to want something like that if you want to sleep in a lean to for instance, because you will get snow getting inside there. See, the, the vapor barrier keeps the moisture, and you pass moisture all night whether you realize it or not. And to evaporate moisture, I don't have all the numbers in my head, but it's about eight to ten times more than evaporating than melting ice. So it's a tremendous amount of heat is lost that way. Uh, and if you can prevent that moisture from getting in your bag and, like Dave said, compromising your down, you stay warmer. So where you said there was a vapor. Well, all right. This basically this is a bivy sack that goes over the top the protection bag like in the tent and it'll lead to blowing snow or anything else. And it also adds 10 degrees of uh, warmth for warmth. And if you want to add extra warmth, you take off the down jacket like I had and you lay it on top here and now you've got that much more loft on top for added insulation. But now, put what I've got inside, inside, see this one also has the speed of the economic down. This goes inside. Is there, there yes. 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 Oh, okay. Well, I tell you what. I bought a down bag 25 million years ago in North Bay. We buy from a good company. I send it back after about 10 years. They cleaned it and they brought it back up to school. No, spec. I just sent it back last year again for about 35 bucks. They cleaned it, brought it down up to spec. And you will never get that out of a synthetic bag as far as longitudinal. And then you can even unstuff. Right. Right. Uh, best would be ideally to hang them, otherwise I just have them in a big cotton vapor stuff bag. But this is what I would highly recommend, and I looked it up, Campmore does have them. They weigh almost nothing, and you crawl into them, you have the option of drawing it down tight around your neck. Uh, once you're up to feeling warm, you can leave this open, and I, I'll put my damp socks on my chest, I'll put my damp gloves in there, and when I wake up in the morning, everything's dry. So between your body, your clothing, and the down sleeping bag? Pardon? Between your clothing and the down sleeping bag? Yeah, yeah. Well, what you want to try to do, all, well, what I do, I don't bother changing the long johns. I leave the same ones on that I was yeah. hiking in all day, but I do take off the vapor barrier sock, the heavy wool sock, and I put a lighter weight wool sock on, so I've got insulation uniform all the way from my head down to my toes. And then I crawl into here, and say I have to go out and visit a tree. I'll sit up in the bag, pull the vapor barrier down, my down jacket's right next to me, I'll put the down jacket on while I'm still in the bag, get up, and like I've got the, the mucklucks, or you can depend on what you have, and this is by Outdoor Research, it's a full liner, and that, so you can slip into this real quick and go out of the tent. Or you can hop in your regular boots, too. One thing to remember with any of these boots, if they get wet or that, you better sleep on them at night. Because the first time we went out, I slept on them. I did all the good things. They were nice. They were supple. And my mom had given me a pair of down booties. So I put the down booties on. It was 30 below zero. And I felt comfortable. But forgetting about the boots, they were crushed. I got ready to put them on. They were frozen solid, laces and everything. So there we are with the stove running, kind of thawed the boot enough to get it opened up to get in it. And then once we got in it, of course it's all frozen, we're doing jumping jacks to get the blood flowing down to the feet. So if you're going to make a mistake, make some different ones. <laughs> <laughs> so would you put them in like a vapor barrier bag and put them down at the end of your sleeping yeah, bag? Yeah, you put them down in the bag or, or put them in a, a plastic sack or something. I put them under the pillow and cross them. Right. And that works fairly well. Yeah, I've seen people put them in just like plastic Wegmans bags and then just under where their head goes. And yeah. Simple. The other thing I've done, I've got a small little down backpacking pillow for comfort. I'll fold up my fleece jacket to give me the height I need, but I'll put the down pillow inside the hood. And this, it doesn't weigh much, but boy, the difference in comfort, especially out two or three days at a time. I love being next couple there. Yeah, very, very fancy. <laughs> but So that gives you an idea. Now, to check the loft on your bag, you'll see from the notes, it's about seven and a half inches to take you down about zero or whatever. 27 degrees.
for every inch of insulation. So you can go home, you can fluff up your bag, put it on the living room floor, put a ruler across it with a level on it, and measure down, and then divide it by two. And they'll give you, I mean, they might have given your bag a rating of 20, but now it's five years old, it's synthetic, and you've got a reading of, gosh, 40. So they just, I mean, it doesn't matter what the manufacturer said, it's a pure physical law that so much insulation is needed to keep you warm, period. And this is what I've used, it's one of those waffle weave clothes pads, I just cut that into thirds. And then I take two of these things with me when I go, and it does double duty if you're kneeling by your stove, you can kneel on this. When you go into your tent, you put it in the vestibule, and if for some reason you need extra heat under your body, you know, in the mattress, something happens to the mattress for some, um, you've at least got two of these. You can give me extra, you know, uh, insulation. Uh, outdoor Research makes some wonderful regular clothing bags. They're pretty waterproof, and what's nice is they can roll down to accommodate whatever you've got in, and they Velcro shut. But like I said, for the sleeping bag, make sure you've got a big, heavy-duty plastic bag around it. I mean, that is your last line of defense if you get wet and cold, and you don't want that to get wet. And I know Dave's gone through the water a couple times. I've gone in twice. Uh, not far, but it could have been. And I had to, you know, empty the boot out of water and so on. Like it was only in the upper 20. But it could be worse. This way, you can always change to something that's dry. Or get into the warmth. And then the stuff sack, like Dave showed you, for compressing things. All right, we've covered down this line. Let's see where we go next. Ooh. So where did you get your internal baker barrier? This one? No, the... Oh, oh this? That one. Oh, Campmore. Campmore's got them. Oh. got them. I just checked this week. So Campmore's got that. Stephenson has got the vapor barrier socks and the vapor barrier uh, shirt. Sure, sure. This one happens to be an REI, though, for instance. So I know those are available. And like I say, if I had to buy one piece of equipment, I would buy the bag liner. Because you're going to spend eight to ten hours in that bag and you want to stay warm. Yeah. Uh, the vapor barrier sock, you can take a liner sock, synthetic, and saran wrap or a bread bag or a grocery bag and then put your wool sock over the top. Yeah. And what that does is just keeps your wool sock at the same amount of insulation at the beginning of the day as to the end of the day. So if you're warm when you start out, it'll still be warm at the end of the day and you won't have compromised the sock. Whereas if you go in with your bare foot, the sock will be wet and then tomorrow you put it on and it's wet and you'll be cold. I've tried the uh, the basting bags, the oven roast bags, hold up better than the, the grocery bags. All right, yeah. But this one, that they, they came out with this soft, fuzzy stuff one, and this is comfortable. This is nice. Uh, that way I have one of the slippery ones, but it's not as nice. Yeah. But they've ex he's been in business since, I think, the late 50s, mm -hmm. and he's an aerospace engineer. When you read the handout, You'll see how he debunks a lot of the myths of all this stuff that's supposed to be super good. It's basically learn how the uh, tools work and regulate your body temperature by you know taking off extra, putting on extra, yeah. and so on. Now we get into food. One of the things that I've done, a simple waterproof bag to store my food in. So you can hang it up some. Mm -hmm. You won't find any bears, but damn it, they got a lot of them weasels and critters that get out there. Mice. <laughs> Mice. M Mice, yeah, they, they, that's one of the biggest things. I was in one of the lean tubes and I kept hearing this stuff hitting my sleeping bag. And I had to go up on a nail on the beam above me. And the damn little critter was in there, chawing away, and just throwing stuff out. And, and then we were on one thing, I think it was Bill Dean. We were up on going up towards Haystack. And we went back to the tent after relieving ourselves in one of the trees, and I noticed he left his damn food bag outside the vestibule. So we put it, he said, bright red, put it back inside the tent. Then in the morning, Bill comes out and says, where's my food sack? And I said, Bill, you left it outside last night. I put it inside the vestibule. He says, not in there now. 
So we go out and look, and then we find the trail, pine mark. <laughs> and he went maybe two, three hundred yards, ate into it, took out what he wanted. So that afternoon, one of the guys wasn't feeling good, so I came back, leaned to, and stayed with him. He says, hey, Irv, look. Bound, bound, heading over for where the food sack was. <laughs> So, but that's the only time we've really been hit with anything. It was like the Pine Martins. During one of the summer camps, we had everything bear bag, everything you could possibly think of, and something got into my food bag, two holes right through it, right up in the bear rope. And one of my customers who hikes up there all the time says, were you at such and such a lean-to? I said, yeah. He says, guess what? Flying squirrels. They go up this tree and they go, <whistles> bam, land on the top of the sack and start chewing in from the top. So the next time I put the pot up there, and the next morning I come and I got holes in the bottom of my sack. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes you can't win. Now they've got, I don't remember the name of it, I bought it and haven't used it yet. It's a chain mail food bag. Red sack. <laughs> is that what it is? Red sack. Yeah. Red sack. Oh. But it's fairly lightweight. You put everything in there and other than a bear, nothing can get in it. So you can take that. And then one of the things you want to remember, one of my friends left his lunch in his pack. He got ready to eat. You could drive nails with it. Pro solid. So I'll put whatever I'm going to have for lunch in something like this, have it under my jacket. Just think about that. Mm -hmm. There's nothing like, and I still remember from way back, waking up in the morning on the second day and remembering that you forgot to remember to put <laughs> your muffin, put your sandwich fixes into the sleeping bag and it's outside. <laughs> So you just open up your shirt, grin and bear it, and stick it against your stomach. And by noon it's thawed. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll remember it the next time. So those are some of the things just to consider. It's a luxury, but an insulated coffee cup like this is wonderful. Uh, you get the camp. I learned that from, I can't think of one of the winter mountaineers, uh, Gary Mitchell. He was very well organized. And he would sit in the vestibule of his tent on a little pad, and he'd have scooped up a whole great big black plastic bag of snow, fresh. And as he sat in the vestibule, he put the snow into the pot. And what you should remember, you need water in your pot to start the process. Otherwise, you'll burn the bejesus out of the bottom of your pot before the snow melts. Either that or you've got to pick up the pot like this way above the flame and gently move it back and forth till you get water in there. Because otherwise, if you watch carefully, the snow will just go right up off the top of the bottom of the pot, and the pot won't have anything wet down there. So anyway, once he got the stove going and got water, he would take a cup. You know, we got the cup here, here. We can put a lot of these things all together. In, and then he could use the cup for measuring or scooping snow. And then each person would have a ration of like hot jello, and he had a little bottle like this marked with, four, with a piece of tape divided into four quadrants for the four of us in the tent. And each one got a little shot of brandy in with his jello. So you've got two things working for you. One, you've got liquid to go in your system, which you need. The jello has got a lot of sugar in it. And a limited amount of alcohol, what it does, it moves the core heat from here out to your fingertips and toes. Of course, if you do too much, then you lower the temperature too far, but a little bit, less than an ounce, just gives you that warm feeling. And then the next cup he'd have, everybody would have like a cup of soup mix. And then once everybody got fairly hydrated, then you'd sit down and prepare your meal. So you'll see the handout. We won't go into all the, the preparation and cooking stuff, but basically what you can do is take something like this, your closed cell phone, and make a pad to go under your pot, and then take enough, you can see how the mice liked my pot cover. <laughs> but anyway, high tech, one shoelace and a cord lock, and essentially what you do, you get your pot of food cooking, let it boil for about a minute or so, and then take it and put it in the parka put the cover on and then you go back to melting snow and in 20 minutes or so your dinner's done. You take the pot, put it back on the stove, bring it up to, you know, bubbling, and then you put it back in the cozy and everybody then can take 
literally a half a ration, eat it, and then come back to the pot and it's still hot. So that'll give you one thing we've done over all the years. And then what we have found that works excellent is buy a dehydrator if you do any of this for any length of time. It beats the hell out of freeze-dried food. You know, and you can customize it any way you want. For instance, if you're lazy, you can go to the deli and get ham and shred it, roast beef and shred it, uh, and it dries overnight. You can take a, a pack of like frozen peas and put it on the dehydrator in the morning. You get the tray, put it in a paper bag, and then dump it into a little glass jar, and you'll find that your one pound bag of peas now is about a little bitty thing that fills up a cup. So you can start to portion out. I mean, how many people would the bag normally feed? We'll just say arbitrarily it, it would feed four. Well, now it's down to four ounces, so you know one ounce of peas will give you a portion. And you can do one of the meals we did that was really wonderful for winter. Cook up your hamburger and spice it like you would. Pour off the oil, but because you don't want to, you're not going to worry about it getting rancid. Don't bother washing it and getting the oil off because you take the taste out. It'll be like cardboard. Dry it, then cook up macaroni shells or elbows, and put them in the dryer. And then take your tomato sauce and put it on the fruit leather tray and dry it. So you've got a complete spaghetti dinner. Essentially, take fresh Parmesan cheese in a container. Take some water, put it in the pot. Rip your leather apart, put it in the pot, get it soaking. Throw your hamburger in and get the whole thing simmering. And then when it's good, add extra water if you need more sauce. Toss in your macaroni, uh, put it in the cozy, and 15 minutes later you got a spaghetti dinner. And it don't get no better than that. <laughs> and if you want to really be decadent, one of the guys, uh, remember Bill Deans with his Yukon Jack? Well, one of my buddies <laughs> wanted to outdo me with the supper, so he baked a whole bunch of little shortcakes like that. So each of us had a shortcake and he dried fresh strawberries. And then we had the brilliant idea, gosh, Bill's got Yukon Jack. Let's rehydrate him in Yukon Jack. <laughs> and someone said, should we light it? And I said, hell no. <laughs> and I tell you what, it made a marvelous dessert. I mean, those are some things you can fool around with. Uh, one of the guys would uh, bake brownies in these cup of soup boxes. He'd put the ration for the four of us in a cup of soup box so they wouldn't crumble. So then when you pulled it out, we each had a brownie. So you can use your imagination. The cooking list is there. And don't feel you have to skim. The biggest thing that most people make in a mistake, they don't bring enough food and enough high calorie stuff. And one of the things I've done for hiking is I fry up, I got a German butcher shop on Parcells Avenue, and I get their smoked bacon. I cut it into you know, bite-sized pieces, fry it up, and I just leave that in a plastic sack during the day and nibble on that. That's pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, blocks of cheese. You, you, you can cut up stuff that are you know, a mouthful size and stick that somewhere on your person as opposed to in the back. Otherwise, you won't be able to bite into it easy. Mm -hmm. So, what I've showed you here is just some of the things. You can have some measuring spoons, or now they've got these sporks that work really good at it. It's not high tech. It could also be a Tupperware container with a lid on it, but that's about all the size you need. If you get much more than that, or it's, or it's metal, it just sucks the heat out of your food so fast. It's not good. And then you can have things like a little salt and pepper shaker, garlic salt, and then this is something you could make yourself. I don't know where they got it. You get an aquarium or something. But when you melt snow, a lot of times you'll pick up forest, you know, debris of all kinds of things, you know, pine needles and pine cone parts and so on. And this way when you're pouring the water, you pour it through the little stringer. That's just a convenient type thing. Otherwise, just put your teeth together when you're drinking. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're going to do anything in the fry pan, a wooden spatula is good, small one. Uh, some of you guys probably aren't aware of the Outback Oven. This is the greatest little thing for a small amount of weight. Uh, I use it in winter all the time, melting snow and cooking, because it'll fit over your pot. They just leave enough ventilation around here so you get air in there, and it just sits right on top of the lid. Now open it up. Goes 
put them in the pot there. But see, this will go over the pot, and that way it's a convection oven for all intents and purposes. See, the heat is trapped all the way around your pot. And it's also nice to put your hand over the top, you can warm your fingers. <laughs> but we were doing one canoe trip and had that, we were baking brownies on the trail, uh, ribeye steak on a shish kebab, <laughs> and fresh bottle of wine, bread. I mean, these poor guys were backpacking in, they look at us, they're smelling this stuff, and they're thinking. <laughs> but it all took up just, I mean, when you cut the steak up, it was small parts. The skewer was on the woods floor. A small little fire. You don't need big fires to do that. And the brownies just cooked in a, a Teflon line can. Now I don't have the company that made that. I don't know if they still make those type of pans, but you can still get from Camp Moore. I think it's Bugaboo or something like that. Has some Teflon uh, cookware. And where that's nice, I used to have stainless steel for years. And yeah, it, it cleans up easy and all that stuff relatively. But you get something like mac and cheese, and it welds itself to stainless steel, and you don't get it off till you get home. Ask me how we know. <laughs> <laughs> we're on a canoe trip up in the high peak area, you know. I think it's, I can't remember which, it doesn't matter which lake. Anyways, in, in the chain of lakes in there. And it was October, we got up there. And it was relatively cold, so that night we made mac and cheese, and it had one of those squeezable cheeses in there. We ate the whole thing, we were tired, so we left the pot. In the middle of the night, I kept hearing things on the tent. I thought it was you know, like leaves falling down. And I'm nearsighted as hell. I had to go up and find a tree, and I look out there, why is it so bright out there? Well, we got about that much snow overnight. This is October. Well, anyway, that was part of what we had to do, and you're, you're out in a canoe heading back, and you think you should really be in a dog sled heading back. <laughs> but that's where the fleece came in. Fleece, the wind jacket, gloves, and that way you're prepared for basically whatever happens. Uh, the one thing you'll, you'll might need to know with the stove, I don't know what type you've got, but forget canister stoves, just leave those home. They ain't going to work. They, they rely on pressure differential, and as the heat goes down, the pressure goes down, and they don't work. And if you get something like an MSR or that, you better find something to rest it on when you put it on the snow. I mean, if you can dig down a bare ground, that's wonderful, but if you're up in the Adirondacks, there's five foot of snow, that's kind of impractical. And one of the guys in the last trip we went on, he had a stove all there, and he was simmering away, and all of a sudden the stove just goes, <laughs> and the whole pot of food goes all over the snow. I said, well, at least you're lucky it's not yellow snow or anything. You can pack it up, put it back in the pot, and dig down, and set your stove up again. So, But what I have found, this was like a vinegar jug or a cider jug, heavy duty. Uh, it does three things. One, it carries your stove and everything in there so none of the parts get broken. It makes a wash basin. And all your spare parts and like a little scrubber, uh, I take a black plastic along. So when you want to open up your food bag, if you leave it on the snow, it can, things can get lost. And if you've got a, a white plastic one, it's hard to find the damn thing. Whereas this is readily visible, especially if it's snowing, and you can take all your things out, put it on here, weight it down, and then when you're done, you shake everything out and put it back. I got a little like dishcloth. Uh, I mean, how many of you guys have got like a white gas stove? Well, just a few of you. One of the things that is good to know is to take alcohol and use alcohol as the priming. One, it won't soot up your stove, and you don't get that big, heavy flash about that high when the gas goes off. <laughs> and you can easily get a small little bottle eyedropper or something like that and, and put the alcohol in the stove. And what I've done here, I haven't got the whole stove set up, but I've got my fuel bottle. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the hand sanitizer. Well, they didn't have that when I started out. Yeah, right. <laughs> but that, that, that'd be perfect. The, the trick about this is when you light it, it doesn't look like it's lit, but it is. <laughs> yeah, it's hot. You don't see the flame. The other thing I do for making something compact, I got high tech, two paper clips with a string between them. Hold your windscreen together. And when you're done, you wrap it around your 
fuel container, and then you, you, you put it in a sack that protects it. And same with the other components, like I've got, for instance, I don't leave it in the bottle, but I leave it protected in a plastic wrap. And then for the stove, I've got a repair kit if you need something. MSR stoves are excellent. Uh, they're probably the best. When I was first into this, I had a little bitty Optimus one with a four ounce tank. And at 30 below, it, it doesn't work as well as one would like it. And as I'm hiking out at 30 degrees, I look at all these winter mountaineers coming in with all their thousand dollar suits. And I kept asking everyone, what stove do you have? MSR, MSR. So when I got home, I bought an MSR. I'm on my second one now. <laughs> and this one simmers better than the, the, the original. But if you got the Expedition one, it has one flame, hot, period. Yeah. And it's used for melting snow and water and that. There's no simmer on it or anything else. But this is the Dragonfly, and it's got what they call a trillium base. You can buy that from Camp Moore, or you can make something. But this way, the base locks right on, and it's flat, so it sits on top of the snow. And what's nice, it's got a, a, a simmer control here. You can get this down to a real small flame. So if you want to bake or just simmer something and don't want to waste a lot of fuel, that's an excellent thing to have. And then with the Outback oven, it's got uh, essentially a flame tamer. You can all, this was before I had this stuff, so you can put this on top, put your pan on top, and you get just a gentle heat. Mm -hmm. Or if you're baking, you would get this on top, the gentle heat would go around and be just like a convection oven at home. You can bake your brownies in 15 minutes and it works really nice. Uh, the other thing I found that was very handy, uh, this is the best lighter I've ever had. It's a refillable butane. It's by Windmill, Japanese company. And what's nice with this, I wear it around my neck so it stays warm. Again, propane or butane and all these gases. Uh, simple. You almost can't see it, but if you notice, the flame goes up Mm -hmm. If you put it sideways, it goes sideways. If you put it down, it goes down. It doesn't wick around and burn your thumb, mm -hmm. you know, like a Bic would do. Yeah. Yeah. And with the, where that's nice is when you want to light the stuff there so you can get like this and light it. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it's reliable for doing the lantern and that. And like I say, you just... And then when you need it, it's always there. And it doesn't hurt to sometimes take another backup unit. It could be a Bic or something else. Because the one thing you don't want to be without is flame. Now, another thing here, this is my emergency pack. And one thing I can stress is that when you go in a group, whether it's a two-man tent, three-man tent, four-man tent, it takes a little logistical figuring, but figure out how to divide the food between all the participants. Because if one guy carries all the food in, when he goes out, he has the lightest pack. <laughs> okay? Divide up the tent. Divide up all the community gear. Numbers weigh everything. So each person's got about an equal amount of weight or as much weight as they can carry. And then when you get to camp, not everybody has to have, for instance, a big cook kit. Not everybody has to have a stove in your tent. One. And for emergency, I carried a small folding saw. You can make deadmen for your tent, you know, just cut out a small limb and tie a string to it. Mainly, it's emergency. Somebody falls in the water and you've got to get a fire going to dry them out. You need something to cut initially to get stuff going. And the wood that works best is contrary to what they tell you in all the don't cut living wood and all this. Standing dead pine. This is emergency only cut the branch off, saw it, cut it into small pieces, and split it. The inside is dry. And that way, if you can clear it to, to, to you know, bare ground to build your fire, clear to bare ground. If you can't, then lay a bunch of logs on top of the snow and build your fire on top of that. But one thing that we found that was super handy, again, this is emergency only, these fire cubes, they're just cotton saturated with uh, like petroleum jelly or wax. And then, this is the simplest thing going. It's like a bellows. That way you don't have to stick your nose right down in the fire. And with the brass, you put it right where it's starting to go. And by blowing on it, you have 
a good source of thing. We can practice with some of this if we go up to my place. Oh, what do we got now? I mentioned the fuel bottle with gloves below and the pad under the stove, the insulated thing. You'll, you'll see that you know, at one point, one of the books said wash with snow. If it's sub-zero, that don't work. It freezes to the pot, too. But if you put just a little warm water in your pot, and with your finger like no scrubber, you can wash out pretty much the debris. And then, if you're careful, you don't use soap, you can just drink what's left in the pot, and it's clean. Well, lots of, lots of liquid, because as you're hiking, you burn up a lot of water. And when your system gets dehydrated, the blood gets thicker, you run the risk of having a headache in the afternoon and cold. And same thing at night. Drinking water and eating like cheese or something is not a bad idea. Yeah, i got to go up and uh, relieve myself. Well, don't wait too long. It only gets worse. <laughs> <laughs> and if you put a jacket on or something, it's not, not the worst thing in the world. You can go out, quickly do it, come back, hop into your tent, and you're warm again. You want to cover some of the stuff on the water bottle, Dave? Water bottles. What I usually do with the water bottle is, especially um, before you go to bed at night, I always tip it upside down. You can bury it in the snow. And the reason for that is so that when you get up, this part doesn't freeze. So it's don't easy have a narrow one. neck on one. And don't get a narrow By the way, these bottles, if you notice, um, were actually developed for recreation by the Rochester Winter Mountaineering Society. Most of the members back in the old days all worked for Kodak in the research labs, and they used these bottles. So somebody had the bright idea, says, I'm going to write a letter to these guys and tell them they should start making these for recreation purposes because they're ideal. In the old days, they would have this instead. They didn't have this, so they would use uh, fiberglass or whatever to insulate this from it, and of course it was all duct tape put together, so it kind of looks ridic ridiculous, but it worked. So REI and a few others came out where you can just stick those in there, and this was all developed by the Winter, Rochester Winter Mountaineering Society. And, the reason, and they found out that the best way to keep these things from freezing was to bury it upside down in the snow, or put it in your sleeping bag at night. You can do that too. Just make sure the lid's out. Tight. Sure. Someone filled my bottle and didn't do that and I left it next to my down jacket and I got up in the middle of the night to put it on and nothing functioned quite right. It was froze the solid. Yeah, you want to uh, make sure that uh, you have that on tight. So the water bottle, and I might add, um, this, these particular, this particular type does not crack as, as easily as the, the newer ones. Um, in the wintertime, they have a tendency that becomes pretty brittle, but these hold up fairly well. So you probably had this for a long time, eh? Yeah. yeah. What, what number is that as far as the... A quart. But I mean, as far isn't there like a plastic number on the bottom? Or? There is now. At least uh, back then, the... You've got to remember, we started out back like 25 years ago, and a lot of the, some of the stuff we had to make or do research on, and now they've got a lot of new gear, but basically, ice forms at the top of water. So if you got it turned upside down, you get it at the bottom of your water bottle. You'd be surprised how many water bottles we had a thought at my place during some of the first expeditions up there. People would have narrow mouths, or they'd leave them exposed, and I'd sit in the tent, or actually we'd be out in my little cabin, two stoves going, <laughs> big pot of water, stick the bottle in the top, loosen up the cap, you know, try to get stuff out of it, then pour hot water in, you know. So if we can avoid the problem, it's a good idea. And it's a good idea to go to bed at night with at least one quart of warm water. It can also warm up the bottom of your sleeping bag, too. Why did you just say don't do the narrow neck? Does that freeze? It freezes more readily. Yeah. Well, I use it open, too. You know, with, with gloves on, you know, you got those right. thick, heavy gloves, and yeah, it's really easy to open up. So I have a technique, and I want to know if there's so if it's maybe bad to do, but what I'll do overnight is um, take my water bottle, make sure the cap's on really tough, uh, boil water, uh, fill up the bottle, throw a heavy wool, weight wool sock over that, and then stick that in my hiking boot, 
which keeps yep. the water bottle insulated and the boot warm, and if it's going to be super cold, also throwing in a chemical hand warmer into the... Oh, the excellent boot. idea, yeah. And then wrap it in a bag. One of the Air Force majors I used to hike with, he would have two little hand warmers, and that's where he wasn't using vapor barriers. He dropped the hand warmer, one in each boot, and then he did exactly what you did, put the water bottle in there as a cork, and had warm water in the morning and a dry boot. Yeah, excellent. I've never tried that, but that, that certainly worked because you've got the insulation on the boot. I might add that uh, when you're going out and if you decide you're going to be going out and the temperatures are below zero, just keep in mind that in the morning you're going to be moving slow. Everything happens slow. Everything cooks slow. You don't get out of your bag real fast. Everything, and it's okay. That's what you're supposed to do. It's like your car. You know, you want to start your car up, you have the old joke, no, whoa, whoa, way. No, whoa, whoa, way. That's us too. No, whoa, whoa, way. No. Well, the same major in the Air Force, he was a stickler for his hot coffee in the morning. So what he did, he got one of these sleds you pull. Dave's got one of those. They work good in the boundary waters where it's flat. But it took three of us to operate the sled because we had two guys on ropes to keep it from sliding diagonally down the hill. But he had his hot baked thermos. And we just went to the lecture on, on Lapland. And when I talked to him, each person had two quart thermos. So they have constant hot water all the time. But when you got to backpack that, that's a different story. You know? That's too damn heavy you know, from that standpoint. Let's see, we're going down through the list here. We covered this. It's a good idea to have possibly two sources of light for camp. The headlamp is outstanding. They, I just bought one of the new ones from Cabela's. They got the LEDs in it. My God, the brightness <laughs> and the focus is just wonderful. But you need it, like you're setting up camp, it's dark. You're trying to cook. You can check what's in the pot, etc. It's nice to have. And it doesn't hurt to have a backup unit. And it's, this one has to have my bragging rights. It's a thermometer. <laughs> Jim was 30 below zero. Holy mackerel, and I survived. <laughs> uh, but it's just nice to have that. And of course, you want to make sure on your person you've got a compass and a map of the area you're going to. The other thing that's handy uh, in the tent or something, either a small pack towel or a sponge. Because as Dave said, you know, as you breathe, you get condensation in the tent, it, or something spills, you can wipe it up. And the other thing to remember, if you can avoid it, do not cook in the tent. Uh, we had to do it once, and what you do there is you get everything set up inside the tent, but you light the stove and get it running outside the tent. And when it's running properly, then you bring it into the vestibule, leave it vented, so you don't, you know, have the carbon monoxide build up. But what will happen is you'll get the whole vestibule covered with water from cooking. And then you'll need to dry that from that standpoint. Uh, covered with everything here. Mm. Well, as I mentioned about food, have your snacks easy to get at. Uh, I have, I'll show you on the pouch there. I have a small little pouch right here that carries like cat crap for your glasses so they don't steam up. Sinus type pills, you know, sit an effort into that because a lot of times your nose will run like crazy. You can pop one of those and that'll slow it down. Uh, chapstick. Uh, and then I have a small Ziploc bag which I, I put, you know, a few handfuls of snack in. I can recharge it at noon or at night for the next day. But it's always readily available. The water bottle's on the other side. <coughs> All right, sanitation in the woods. How to shit in the woods. <laughs> well, you might laugh at this, but it works. It's best to take your toilet paper out and other feminine products, etc., in a plastic bag. But if you want to get rid of doing that, a good handful of snow, when a snowball takes care of all that for you, as far as cleanup. And it's disposable. The thing you can also find is handy a lot of times in the woods a big tree, dark bark, south side. If you dig down along the south side of the tree, a lot of times the ground underneath by the roots is still thawed out because of the heat coming down. So if you have to bury something, that's something that'll work. Uh, basically, the, the ranger also, when we were up to, uh, oh, uh, 
I forgot which one of the peaks. But anyway, he was up there. We had our tent set over like a ravine, slightly, and he said, you guys have to move that. And I said, but why? The lake's way the hell down there. He says, yeah, but you didn't notice. It's in a drainage thing. And I said, I know you guys. You're going to hop out of the tent, find the first tree, pee on it, and then hop back in. Well, in the spring, all that will run right down to the pond. <laughs> something, you know, you never consider. But something to think about, certainly. Well, basically, in the miscellaneous section, we've talked about the pad, the flashlight, an oil, a candle lantern, sponges. Bring your camera. You know, you've got that. There's lots of, you know, good pictures to take. Uh, how to waterproof beer. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Nick Wax products the UMS carries. They're excellent. Uh, you can take fleece and wash it with the stuff, and it makes it water repellent. Uh, you can rejuvenate your down, you rejuvenate your Gore-Tex. Uh, all those things so you can keep all your gear. I mean, some of the stuff you see in this table is 25 years old. Just keeping it clean, keeping it put away, and upgrading it. Uh, one thing that I like to have, um, and that is some form of ski pole. Put a basket on it. This thing's older than most of you guys. <laughs> but I upgraded it with, with webbing in that and a new handle. And what's nice, you're going over a log or something, you can put that down and stabilize it, lift your leg, go over. Uh, on ice or that, you can tap it and check you know, how it is. Uh, it just gives you a good sense of stability. Now, when they're doing that Lapland movie, he said that's how they anchor the tents. They have baskets that come off. And then you just take the tent pole and stick it through the four corners of the tent and it doesn't blow away, hopefully. I still like my trees and the antirotics, thank you. <laughs> and for those of you that are considering on, or have already done so, climbed several peaks in the wintertime, um, I prefer to take an ice axe with me as well as a ski pole, and as a walking stick. And um, basically a rule of thumb is it would be, it had come up to about here on you. And what the ice axe will do for you is you can jam it into the ground on very icy conditions, or it's got the pick on it where you can actually hit something, cross around a tree so you can actually make it easier. You're going for you up to a climb. steep pitch, and Dave could go up twice as fast as I could with just a ski pole. And, the, and of course, it's got the shovel on it, so if you slip, you can turn yourself around and use it to slow yourself down so you're not sliding weight down the side of a mountainside. Uh, most of the Winter Mountaineering Society people, they all have ice axes. Um, but that's just, uh, some do, some don't. Also, the ski poles, you can also buy them, they're telescopic. You can actually, um, you, and I prefer those, because if you're climbing, going uphill, you want it shorter than longer. Just make sure that you tighten it really good so that it uh, doesn't collapse on you, other than that. Uh, also, you know, one thing that uh, has happened many, many times with snowshoes, and this is why most of us like the aluminum snowshoes versus the wood, Sometimes these will break. These are easy to repair in the woods. All you have to do is um, you could put a piece of a stick in here with some copper wire. Just take a little bit of copper wire with you as an emergency in case you do break one of the, the wooden ones. What happens is when they break, they just it all comes in and it's very difficult to repair out in the woods. And you certainly don't like walking out of the woods in about five to six feet of snow. Uh, you're not going to make much, you're going to get tired in a real Plus, you're going to hang them high, the uh, wooden ones, because they got rawhide lacing, and you don't want the mice chewing on them. And of course, you got the emergency tips for uh, skis, too, where you can put the, the emergency tip on your ski in case you break a ski. Um, and of course, as you know, in the high peaks, it's required that you have to either wear be on skis or on skis. Well, the first one I went up there, you know, I heard everybody tell me how hard it was up to go to Marcy Dam with all the rocks, and I said, God, they must be a bunch of wimps. This isn't too bad. <laughs> so when I got out, I found out it was five foot of snow on the ground. <laughs> and I discovered that when I got up to Avalanche Pass, I got tired of wearing my brother's great big bear paws for the first time, and I took them off, and I went to stand on the snow, and I went up to my waist, grabbed the tree, and I said, and I guess that answers that question. I had a few bunch of snowshoes on so, but this will just give you an idea of some of the stuff on the pack. Uh, one person in the group, a little hatchet like this, again for emergencies, driving tent picks so you can saw off a piece of board or something. But that was handy. I got a small little Swiss knife as far as that. 
Um, I've got, yeah, I usually have a water bottle and something on the side. Now here's a snack pack. I got the snack pack in here and I got, you know, like ibuprofen, sinus tabs, chapstick, everything in the front compartment. And then here I've got a notebook uh, and things like that. What you want to do when you're preparing your meals, mark down what you take. Was it good? Was it easy to prepare? Was there enough? Was there too much? And you can make it an after action report when you're in your tent. You know, it's 5 o'clock and it's dark already. So you can make notes. Uh, what gear did I wear? Did I use all of it? Did I need something else? And then next time you go out, you can improve on what you already went out and did. Uh, I got my compass right up on top. You can also have a map in the compartment here folded up. Put it on a copy machine and just copy out the section in the, of the place you're going to go to with the, with the topo and that on it. Don't rely on GPS because some places in the mountain you don't get reception. So the only one that really worked is one that works on uh, satellite. Uh, like lost beacons and that, but it's frankly expensive and for most of what we do we don't need that type of expenditure. And then having numerous places where you can tie on stuff, like for instance you could have a sleeping pad up here, tie it on where it's light, you, you want the lightest things up near the top, the heaviest things close to your shoulder, and that uh, usually I'll stuff the sleeping bag way down at the bottom, and think also when you might need certain things like an extra jacket or something. That's probably when you get to camp, so that can be down near the bottom. The mucklucks can go down near the bottom. And then you'll have your food or cook pan and stuff like that and stove up somewhere in this area. Can you think of anything else, Dave? Well, one of the things that a lot of people forget about, especially in the wintertime, is, um, is their, their vehicle. Ah. And it's not only that your vehicle has to be in uh, good sound condition, but also you got to know the weather conditions or where you're going because uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, one time we went up to uh, up to Johns Brook area and uh, there was a group of guys that went up and they parked in a garden parking lot. You know where that is? In Keene Valley? Okay. Well, they didn't bother to check the weather forecast. They got five feet of snow up there. The only way they could get their cars out was the town came up and, and actually dug them out. But it cost them $500. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. Now it's really easy, like for instance in Key Valley, because the Mountaineer store is real close by and they always give a weather forecast. You can always check it there, but you know, nowadays, you can always do it on your smartphone and just see what the weather forecast is in a certain area. And you may want to consider, well, do I really want to make, turn this into a death march? Uh, I really don't want to go up when it's 20 below zero, so maybe I'll go south. Weekend. I'll go into Pennsylvania rather than go into the, uh, into the Adirondacks. So that's an option. So well, another thing with the car, Dave reminded me of that, it's nice to have a little gym bag or something with a dry set of warm, non-cotton clothes. Because we've had that, remember the one rain out time, and you come back to the car and everybody is soaked. You just sort of, well like the joke was when I lived in the TP, and you had mixed company in the TP, you just say, go change in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> so you just sort of turn your back on the others in the party and get undressed and everything and then hop into dry, warm stuff for the ride back. And the other thing we found out is some of these parking lots, instead of parking side by side, park behind each other. So there's one guy that's out by the road, so all he got to do is everybody digs him out and everybody just follows out. So there's very little digging that you have to do if you're, everybody's lined up and everybody's got to dig themselves out. You line them up behind each other, it makes it a whole lot easier. To get We're having out. a good snow shovel and, good and snow jumper cables. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah. One thing I might add, uh, especially when it's really cold, like uh, Lake Placid, uh, one year we were up there and the high for the day was 20 below zero. Um, so I was driving home and the windshield washer fluid did not thaw out until I was to Syracuse. <laughs> That was real bad because of the, you know, all the slush on the throughway and so on. Oh man, that was that was not. Well, we had one time when that we came not. back, we had the windows partly open, and we looked on the side for telephone poles, and we drove down the middle of the road, and we saw another car coming. He was driving down the middle of the road too, and it was only when we came next to each other we just shifted over and then came back down the. Middle. We couldn't see anything, you know, blinding snowstorm and everything else. So that's why I said having extra warm, dry clothes. 
flashlights and stuff like that, or an extra snack in the car is not a bad idea. So do we have any questions? Or you're all ready to go and try it? <laughs> <laughs> what I'm going to ask you to do is contact Dave if you're interested in going. And he's going to try to get a form together where if you don't have certain parts of the gear, sometimes what we used to do when I was doing it before, we'd pair up people. One's got a tent, one doesn't have a tent. One has a stove, one doesn't have a stove. Do you mind sleeping with mixed company or not? Are you a vegetarian or not? I mean, so we can sort of get compatible people in the same group. And we might try carpooling too, depending on how many are coming up there. I talked to the highway department, and he will try to open us up a little section in front of my place where you park cars on the shoulder from that standpoint. But if you don't have the gear, you can try to, you might be able to rent something, you might be able to borrow something. And as a safety valve, so to speak, your car is only going to be 500 feet or so from where we're camping. And I have a small log cabin with a wood stove. So there's always a backup unit where you can get rewarmed or something like that. But if you want, you can always try some of these ideas, like I say, out in your backyard. And I have a thermometer, a notebook, and a flashlight. And then I can see if I'm comfortable. If I'm comfortable, fine, I'll stay the whole night. If I'm not, I only have to go that far and turn the key and go inside my garage. You know. Here, one other question. You were talking about food that keeps you warm. Could you touch on that a little bit more? Okay, yeah, we can go into the, the, the food section. Basically, to say breakfast, what I've done, I take a Ziploc bag and put in the larger amount of oatmeal for each person. Like one and a half servings is better. I have a dehydrator, so I dehydrate, you know, fruit of any type, or you can get raisins, you can get dried cranberries now, you put that in there. Then I take a stick of butter and cut off a chunk about that big and mix it in with the oatmeal. Then I'll have some sugar in there and some powdered milk in it. Well, then I have the whole unit can go into, on the bag it's marked uh, so many servings, and I have to add so much water. So I just measure the water, put it in the pot, water comes up to temperature, I throw it in, and then when you get a, at least a bowl, a bowl and a half that size of oatmeal with butter, with fruit, with sugar, with milk. And then I happen to like my coffee, so I cheat and I have instant coffee. But it's hot. It could be cocoa, it could be tea, something like that. Just remember that coffee is a diuretic. Uh, so you'll have to drink extra water to make up for the difference. And then for lunch, what I have found worked very well for me Usually English muffins are pretty indestructible in a Ziploc. <laughs> well, you just kind of have, and then I'll go to the German butcher shop and like salamis and that have a lot of fat in them. Or you can get, well, uh, I go to Swan's, it's on Parcells Avenue, and he pulp smokes and home make all of his sausages, they're excellent. I can testify to that, I just dropped $70 yesterday on them. <laughs> uh, but they're, they're good. Like I say, I'll have some sliced bacon fried, eat that cold. You can have salami mixed in with butter on your, your bread. Uh, so you've got some, like Swiss cheese. I like small squares. I like Swiss. It could be good. It could be anything else. But cheese is high in fat and energy, essentially. Uh, if you like peanut butter, uh, one guy crossed the entire ocean in a boat loaded with nothing but peanut butter. <laughs> he said, I don't ever want to see it again. <laughs> but when he figured it out, the, the amount of weight for the amount of calories, it was the highest concentration of both, keeping you warm, etc. Will peanut butter freeze? Huh? Will peanut butter freeze? Well, yeah, but it, so you've got to remember, as I said, any of your sandwiches, I wear them. Or if you want, you take your sandwich for the next night, most of you will probably only stay out over one night. We were doing like three and more nights. So you take your sandwich that's frozen and put it in the bottom of your sleeping bag. And then it thaws out overnight, and then you wear your sandwich. <laughs> you know. Or put it close to your backpack, close to the back of your backpack. Yeah. It'll, it'll keep it warm. Mm -hmm. This is where you just got to start to experiment with stuff. But Bite-sized pieces of cheese, instead of getting a whole big block, you cut up into small pieces that you can easily pack into a Ziploc and stick it into a jacket pocket. Then you can reach in at any time and do that. Suppers, 
what we found it works really well. And again, a dehydrator is nice. You can also do it in your oven, but if you do a lot of this stuff, I'll tell you one thing that's dynamite is a fresh pineapple this time of year. You cut it into wedges like this, and about that thick, and you dry it. It's nothing like the store-bought ones. They're super sweet in that. The only thing I have to warn you about is because it tastes so damn good, don't eat too much of it. It's very acid. <laughs> one, one day, four of us skiing killed an entire pineapple. Mouth felt like <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, that's just something. You can dry blueberries. You can dry, you know, any of stuff. Or if you go to the store and you buy like Wegmans apricots, they're sort of sticky and moist. Well, you put them in the dryer overnight and then they don't have that sticky feel. And you can get cut that up in oatmeal or anything like that. Lunches I pretty much have done myself, uh, like muffins. They, they, they travel very easy. Suppers, uh, you can go and get some of these Near East peel-offs. There's all kinds of different ones with rice or red beans or any of this stuff like that. I've done uh, scalloped potatoes. Uh, I mentioned how we did the spaghetti type of thing. But with a pre-packaged thing like that, and of course in winter, a lot of this stuff you don't have to dry. There's no reason why you can't carry fresh. For instance, you can go to like the German shop or Wegmans and get sausages and cut them up into little sections like this, put them in a pack. They're not going to spoil. I mean, it's like a refrigerator in your back. And then when you get to camp, you can have pre-made rice, for instance, can already be cooked. Uh, you can have dried, you know, uh, peas or whatever else. Carrots work excellent. I mean, you can shred those dry them or just cut them up into little thin slivers, put them in your water, and even if they aren't cooked all the way, they're, they're still half cooked. You've got rice, you've got partially dried macaroni, uh, the peel-offs, and I toss my meat in there, my vegetable in there, toss in extra butter, or it can be olive oil, if you prefer that. Uh, but see, the oil will give you that long burn later. And then, before you go to bed, if you eat cheese or peanut butter or something like that, it takes two, three hours to digest. And about that time, it's the middle of the night. And sometimes from what I've read, part of your cold can be due to dehydration. So even though you think, I don't want to go up and take a pee again, if you get really dehydrated, your body has wasted it, and most of that water will be actually sucked up into your system and not have to go out. So that's just something to consider. Or, or again, nibble on something warm. Uh, again, the cheese or anything, if you want to nibble on it, don't leave it out in your pack. And the other thing, that, uh, talking about the pack, what I've done too, is carry a length of cord or a bungee cord, and then what I do is hang the pack up on a tree, have a pack cover, which keeps, you know, most of the bad weather off your pack, and then you can leave your various things inside that, and that works pretty good too. Any other questions? Yes? Um, just about water, so do you rely mostly on boiling the snow? Well, the you water? don't actually have to boil it. All you have to do is melt it. Because it's... Yeah. The first choice would be, if you had a choice, uh, and there's running water, you can take the running water and boil it. Uh, don't use a water filter or it only last that one shot and then it's done. Uh, the snow, you don't have to worry about boiling it because it's all clean. And it takes a lot of snow. Uh, if you have a choice and you have ice hanging anywhere, use the ice. Uh, pack snow into your pot. But the thing is, you've got to remember to have water in the pot when you start. Once you've got water in the bottom, you can run the, the temperature way up. In fact, when I went up to the cabin last weekend, I didn't feel like going down on the ice on the pond to get water. I didn't know how you know, thick it was. So I just went out, scooped up snow, filled a coffee pot that big, and put it on the wood stove and a little while later I had about that much water and then go back out and do it again. But the idea that uh, we found work was when you sit in the vestibule of your tent, one, most of your body is protected from the wind. You've got the snow right next to you in a big sack so you don't have to go constantly out to get stuff. You just scoop it, pack it in your uh, pot and let it melt down. Then once you've got your pot filled with water, pour it into the water bottles and fill up everybody's water bottle. That way, if you need to wash dishes or something later or whatever, you've got water already hot in camp. And then after dinner is done, before you do anything else, 
fill up at least one or so water bottles for each person, and then put it in your sleeping bag. When you get it in your sleeping bag, it will feel toasty warm down by your feet. I'm just trying to think of other things. Sausage works very well in winter. Uh, it's got a high fat content. You like to think of some other types of things that would work like that. If you had an outback oven, you could actually do a pizza out there. <laughs> but I haven't gotten to that type. I like one pot simplicity. And usually what I'll do is pack all of the dry ingredients, take them out of the box that they come in, cut off the instruction label, and pour everything into a Ziploc, and then put a piece of tape on there, and it'll say, uh, add two cups of water, cook 15 minutes, type of thing. Does that answer questions now? Oh, oh. Budget-wise, where, uh, where do you distribute your teeth and open the wallet and where can you be a little more? Well, some of the stuff, like I said here, I would not worry about the 50 sack when you're starting out, especially when you're working in this area. I would look at the vapor barrier line because most of you don't have a bag that's rated better than 20. So that will give you a fair amount. <coughs> you can get a space blanket or some reflective blanket for not too much money. And if you get cold, you can tuck it under the sleeping bag. And then you've got some type of a warm jacket or down. You can put that over your chest area. And with the blanket around you, you've added 20 or more degrees. Or you can get uh, fleece pants, fleece shirts. Sometimes you can get uh, secondhand gym type stuff, as long as they're not cotton. That's the biggest thing. Uh, but when you get to camp, what we've usually done is gone into the tent strip down out of some of your stuff because if I'm just wearing wind pants and a set of underwear and you're sitting around you get cold whereas when you're hiking if I get too warm I just unzip them all the way down to my boots and then it's like you're hiking just in a pair of thin underwear and it's only when you have to go downhill that you really want to zip it up so you, if you slip you don't get all the snow piled in on you. Uh, things like the tents like Dave said Three season tents, for the most part that we've seen, work fairly well. You might have to add extra tie points on some. For instance, the A-frame ones like uh, Camp cells. I've seen people up near the peak put a couple little like D-rings or so, and then pull your ropes out. Get this uh, nylon clothesline, and that way you, you can tie that tight. Uh, you want to pull the walls you know, the outer thing away from the bottom, make sure all your seams are sealed, you know, especially around the bottom half. And if you can get a vestibule for the tent, it makes it nice because you can store some of your gear in there, uh, as far as that. Clothing, if you look at the pictures in there, you'll see some of the stuff when I first started out. I had an uncle's zip-up wool sweater, bell-bottom pelaster pants, you know. <laughs> all you have to do is have material that doesn't get you cold like cotton. Uh, in fact, the pants I'm wearing right now, and that hiking around here, I, I can wear the whole thing. They're, they're work pants, uh, Dickies and others. They're 60% they're polyester, 40% uh, cotton, and they dry super quick. Because I'm a landscaper. I work out all day in the field, and when they get wet, they, they dry fairly fast. Uh, use sweaters, wool. It doesn't have to be, you know, uh, polar tech or that but you can easily go to some of these thrift shops and pick up a good wool sweater or that or two. The main thing is it's better to have two lightweight sweaters than one of whatever it is that's too hot, especially with a jacket. You don't want to hike with a really, really thick, hot jacket. I only had to do that once in the last 25 years, and that was that first outing. It was 30 below zero and the wind was blowing. And I wore everything I owned. <laughs> the down jacket under the park, and I wasn't sweating either, trust me but I was very glad to get back up to the lodge. And then I spent the next night in the car and we went and continued hiking. Next question? Sorry for the novice question, but it's why I'm here. And I don't remember the movie that I watched when I was a kid, but uh, it was all about a dog sledder that just took his mom's fruit bread so they didn't have to bother with the stove and cooking and all that time. Um, have you ever met anyone who does winter camping without a stove? It just brings in water and food and does like an overnight well, all right. We've had our share of all kinds of different things. Yes, you can. My brother's done cold rations, uh, you know, primitive 18th century type of thing. But there you, you, I mean, the food doesn't have to be hot. 
uh, it tastes good and so on. The hardest part you're going to have is water. So if you don't have a stove, the next thing you have to be very good in woodsmanship of getting a fire going, which is a pain in the butt. A lot of work. A lot of work. I mean, uh, we had one guy camping with us. I'm talking about a minimalist. This was in summer. Dave remembers that. His entire ration was one bag of grape nuts. <laughs> Period. He just snacked on that all day. Bless his little soul. Of course, then we had one vegetarian with us, and he stopped for a lunch break with a baked potato and wants to know if he can cook it whole in our lunch break time. <laughs> <laughs> no, we've had combinations. You, know, you, you get these, these little things like that. Well, another point to break up, you know, if you have to relieve yourself in the woods and you have to be a young lady, like on my first camp out, just remember to pack the snow around your feet down because the one lady went behind the car where she didn't see me in the lodge and she dropped her drawers and dropped her butt down and hit the snow bank and left this root mark there and bounced up pretty quick. <laughs> but sometimes what you can do, you can use uh, like a tree or something as support if you need to. And if it's on the south side of the tree, like I say, a lot of times the ground there is thawed out. So you can dig a small cap hole in that if you need to. They're just little things we found, you know, over all the years of doing this. Another question? Yeah? Um, if you're going to add one sleeping bag, you know, if you've got currently like a 20 or 35 and you wanted to get something that's going to be the next step for colder weather, where would you start with, like a zero or a below zero? Well, I, the only time I had any crop at all, this is a minus five. Okay. And that's when it was 30 below zero. And I had the, the, the thin orange thermorest. So from underneath, I was comfortable. I could have put one of the closed cell foam in there. But what I had was this cover over the top and a down jacket, and I had to sleep on my side. Because what happens when you sleep on your back and your elbows go, as they compress the thickness of the insulation, it's not three inches thick anymore. So it gets cold on your elbows, or you go off the pad and hit the ground. So either you sleep with your arms to your side like that, or just sleep on your side. Uh, wear a hat. And when I first started, I read from the Pacific Mountaineers. The guy made a snorkel out of polar fleece. Got a bra strap, hooked it around his nose, and stuck it out the tunnel. Well, so I made one. I tried it. I got laughed at. It was kind of dorky. But at 30 below zero, I was like in the bedroom breathing warm air. Uh, since then, what I found worked the gray turtleneck. Absolutely does the same thing. You don't want your face buried in the bag. You want like your nose and mouth out. And by pre-warming the air, you save a tremendous amount of heat. And your body is constantly evaporating sweat, which you can't notice, but your skin has to be moist. And when you go in a vapor barrier, once the humidity gets to a certain level, your body thermostat, or whatever you want to say the mechanism is, turns off the sweat machine. So all of a sudden, you can stay dry. Now, somebody said, gee, I tried the vapor barrier, and I was sweating like crazy. I said, well, then it worked, didn't it? I said, if you were doing jumping jacks in a down jacket, and you started swap, what would you do? I said, well, I'd take it off. Duh! <laughs> Open up your bag. You know, take off a layer or something, you know. It, it doesn't take a great deal of smarts, but you have to think. I mean, if you open the zipper like this, I take my 20-degree bag, and I find it works with a vapor bear from below 20 all the way up to almost 70. And what I do when it's warm, I open the bag up and leave it over like a comforter. And I've done that with the minus 5 bag. It's too damn hot. I just lay on the mattress with this like big bag with a big airspace around me, and I'm comfy. If it gets colder, then I hop into the bag, and I'll zip it up. And if it gets really cold, and I've got my hat on, I hop into the hood. If I need more, I just keep closing it down. But I would say, for most of what we've done, if you went down somewhere around zero or five, the main thing you want to look for, like Dave had the double zipper. This only has one, but a good draft tube. Uh, I don't like them too narrow. Some, you've got to check some of the information. You've got some of these bags. You look like a mummy 
Well, my brother gets into his mummy set, granted he's a lot bigger than I am, but you can see stretch marks coming all the way down when he zips it up. <laughs> it's too tight. Uh, but you want a draft collar. If you don't have a draft collar, you can make one, like I say, out of a shirt. If you don't believe it works, try it with and without it. You can feel as you move the bag bellows, you can feel the warm air going right out through the head part. But I've dried socks in there, and my vapor barrier sock, I'll take them off, turn them inside out, put them on my chest. Uh, mittens, especially, or for the gloves, I'll put those all in with me. And by morning, everything's dry, my underwear is dry, and I'm good to go. So, any other questions? Yeah. You're not a fan of uh, the air mattress? Everything you do is closed? closed yeah, because an air mattress, it sucks the heat right away from your body from the underside down. So, they're, they're, and, and let, now an air mattress will work if you have a closed cell foam on the top of it. But otherwise, it'll give you the comfort, but it'll just suck the heat away from you like you wouldn't believe. Now, Stephenson gets by with an air mattress, but he stuffs his entire air mattress with down. And that's why the Thermarest has got uh, essentially open cell foam in there. Mm -hmm. And it gives you, again, a layer of dead air. See, the trouble with an air mattress with the tubes, the air can circulate like this. You could actually probably have it filled with steel foam or something as long as you've got dead air space. But I know I would not recommend an air mattress. Some of the real tough, hardy ones would just go out with a single, you know, or a double pad like this. And that'll give the insulation, but as I've gotten older, man, that wears thin. <laughs> also, an air mattress will fail. But what happens when it fails, you know? Uh, especially if you've got nothing. That's, that's a real problem. Even, even in the summer and spring, when, that, when you get holes in an air mattress, you're done. It's going to be uncomfortable. It's hard. You can patch them in the field, but it's difficult. If you can find the hole. Well, see, that he's got a valid point. I, the last, in fact, if you buy good quality stuff like Thermarest, I had one of their more luxurious ones. It was 20 inches wide, but it was about 2 to 3 inches thick. And over the years, it would lose its loft overnight. So they have a repair policy. So I said, I'll send it in to be repaired. And I've had that two, three times with products from them. And they sometimes will send you back a second, sometimes they'll patch it, they use their discretion. Either way, you've got a working new pad. This time, they went overboard, and it's not what I wanted, but God, I got it from the cabin. It's pretty nice. It gave the super deluxe model, extra wide, extra long, extra thick. And I got it, and I looked at it, and I tried it, and my wife tried it, and she looks at me in her eyes, and she says, honey, when do I get mine? <laughs> <laughs> and I got it up in the cabin now, and I tell you what, it's like being in a bed. But basically, a, a thermarest type product, which I've used for over 25 years, certainly works. Uh, and I've gotten by with one as, as thin as about an inch and a half. And especially if you've got one or two of these along, if you need any extra insulation on you, just stick one of those under the pad and you're good to go. What kind of weight are you looking at with your pack? 450 pounds. It's not light. Yeah. I mean, what I have done is I've weighed every single piece of equipment that I have and then weighed every single piece of equipment that is community. In other words, if I have a tent and it weighs nine pounds, there's three of us going, we figure three pounds. And I, I divide up the list like that. And the reason I say split the food between all members of the party if somebody's lucky enough to get the food bag going in, when he comes out, that 10 pounds of food isn't in his pack. Whereas everybody else has still got the tent and, you know, stove and community stuff. Mm -hmm. But we found that I've got like, like a three-man tent, three of us would go, we just divide up everything, the tent, the poles. But if you, if you know what the weight is of each object in the community here, you can easily divide it up. And if somebody is small, then what you might do is take more of their share with yourself. Part of it, you want to have a, a bag that has adjustable tension straps on the top. So going up or down hills, you, you can consciously change the balance point for you. Also, you can change the balance point from your hips to your shoulder, or both, or sh simply relieve your shoulder pressure altogether and just put it all on your hips mm -hmm. and have them adjusted accordingly. And get the back stays. I don't know how the new packs are. This one had aluminum stays you could adjust. And I went on one trip for the first time, man, my back was killing me. I went to, I think it was EMS, 
and he took a look, well, your stays are wrong. So he looked at my shoulder there, and he bent them all crazy like, put them back, and just try that. He said, Ooh. <laughs> so I mean, those are the type of things you want to look at. But like I say, you want to keep the weight pretty much up towards your shoulder and as close to you as possible. The minute you start going this way with weight, your pack wants to pull you backwards, especially when you run up and down hills. What size pack are you using to get all that stuff in? The one you see right here. It, it, it goes under a simple premise. If it don't fit, it don't go. <laughs> if I can't carry no more, I don't want to carry anymore. But it is more than a mid size it is more of a large size pack. Because that's why I say what you want to do is get like a compression sack so you can shrink your sleeping bag down. In other words, you want to, I don't carry really anything more than I have to use. The only thing I've got extra of all the things I carry is one set of lightweight long johns, one extra set of socks, my sleeping sock. Everything else I've used. And the reason for the extra is if the weather changes or if I fall in the drink, I want something warm to put on next to my skin where we can get stuff dried out. And that's why I say having a notebook helps. Now I'll tell you one thing, funny story, again, some of the first camp house, we had one woman, she borrowed a lot of equipment. She must have had, this is an overnight, she had I think, two books to read, <laughs> uh, five pounds of snacks, uh, she looked like the caricature of a pack mule for a 49er. <laughs> she had about three or four different things hanging around her neck. She had a soft belt that had all sorts of other stuff on the pack. And my dear friend that was in the Air Force, good old Southern boy, he says, ma'am, take off that damn thing. We're going to repack you a little different. <laughs> but, I mean, she, I mean, you. She had stuff in her hair, around her neck. She's trying to throw stuff on and things are swinging back and forth. And you, you don't, I mean, you won't really starve to death. The only thing you really need in an outing like this, for the most part, is the water. Your body will last more than a day or two until you get back to food if you have to. Uh, a few dry, you know, like granola bars or something will certainly take the pain off. You've got something left in the car like that, you can always nibble on that until you get to a restaurant. But the thing is, weigh out your stuff, get nice sacks that will compress down. I mean, these ones, you know, we've got them out here, Outdoor Research was, I mean, I've had some of the drawstring ones too, and they work fine, and now you can buy all kinds of different size uh, Ziplocs. So you put your gear in a Ziploc and also store it in the thing. That way you know it's dry. But something like this, I've had these for a number of years too, they open up. And unless you're completely underwater, these things are going to keep your stuff dry. They come in different sizes. But like I say, I've seen a number of people just simply pack stuff in various zip boxes and, and they slide easy. So I'll put my sleeping bag down at the bottom, crosswise. And then if I have my muffux, I'll put them on either side. And then I'll look at my things for camp. I'll have my maybe extra underwear. I'll have the uh, the fleece pants, the down jacket, and I'll pack that in next. By that time, you're about halfway up the pack or more. Then if I'm carrying any of the food things, I'll put the stove in there. The fuel bottle will be on the outside. The water bottle will be on the outside. Uh, a lot of times, I carry two water bottles. Uh, and then up near the top, maybe stuff you, you'll want to put in there. For instance, you're too hot in your uh, fleece shirt when you're hiking. You might want to open up your pack and stuff it in the, the top part. Uh, sometimes we even, you know, tack it on the outside with a bungee cord or that. But the, the thing the things you want to do is, before you get too involved with it, see what gear you've got, weigh it out carefully. Like I say, you can't look at a change of underwear and shirts and everything every day. You, you have one for the duration. Enjoy it. When it was in Korea and then we'd be out for a week at a time, you don't wash, you don't do anything. You just you wear it. <laughs> and if you look to some of the old timers, they would literally be in their clothes the whole winter. We aren't quite used to that type of thing, but when they're out there, yes. you know, everybody's going to be the same. <laughs> Another question? Well, yeah. Well, I have a comment, actually, not a question, but one thing that I noticed you didn't touch on is that um, the whole idea of luck 
also goes with your boots. And I kind of learned the hard way last heat winter when it was probably like 50 below on top of Algonquin um, before wind chill. That, um, but you know, I put, I wore, um, my boots were already like just fit properly. Mm. And then I had lightweight to sock liners, heavyweight wool sock. And then because my feet were still cold, I put in some of those chemical foot warmers. Which With all that room. combined, there wasn't enough room for the air to circulate, so the feet actually got colder. So what you want to do when you're looking at boots if you don't have them already, is get some boots. You don't want them too big because your feet will flop around and get blisters. But make sure that there's at least enough room so that if you want to add some layers, you can do that without compressing them all. Absolutely correct. Well, I can say both of these, and uh, there's some other LL Bean boots in that have these heavy felt liners in it. And this one has a removable inner sole. So a lot of times if you've been upgrade your boot, you can get closed cell foam for that that will go inside your boot if, like Dave said, you've allowed enough room. In other words, when you're buying boots, bring the extra socks, bring a liner or something, and try them in the boot and see how well they, they fit. I mean, both of these, this has got the, this one is guaranteed, I think, to 20 below zero. But they're super heavy. Uh, come up here and take a look at some of the stuff. Uh, this one's good, actually, as far as please, you can pass it around and feel the weight on it. But that'll take you through everything slush and snow and snowshoe. And, but you go to some of these outdoors, I don't know how dicks are, if they, you know, are the ones we've got in Rochester, but Cabela's, I know, has hunting stuff for guys that, you know, go out in the nasty weather to do things, and that's where I've gotten a lot of my gear and my men landscaping. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the fleece shirt that I'm wearing now is 100 weight. I got that through Sportive. And it was uh, sold as a second through Sierra Traders. If you don't aren't familiar with Sierra Traders, uh, they have a lot of this outdoor gear. For instance, you might get long john top in blue and a bottom in brown, but it's half price or a third of the regular list price because it was last year's color. I, one of the guys got a down jacket like mine for less than half price because it was pumpkin orange, and they aren't doing that color this year. So it doesn't matter. Two vapor barrier questions. The liner that you put in your bag, if you're using a booby sack, you absolutely want to use that one. Yeah, the reason for that is the outer layer will now be totally waterproof. And if there's any chance of evaporation going through the bag, it'll condense on the booby sack and then get your bag wet from the outside in. And if you're drying socks, you said put them inside. Did you put them in your sleeping bag, or you put them in the vapor barrier? In the vapor liner? barrier, With next your to your body. Okay. Yeah. And, and it works. I mean, I, what you can do if you're cold initially, you draw the cord around. Once your body is up to temperature, I just open it. And I can even leave the draft collar. In other words, you've got to learn how to regulate your system. If you're too hot, move the draft collar off. Unzip the bag, probably, or unzip the foot of the bag. Uh, don't sleep all the way in the hood. You know, there are all these little things, but by wearing a full set of underwear, socks, and a knit cap, you keep the inside of your bag cleaner, as far as that. And a good quality company like North Face, I've sent my stuff back a couple times, and they easily clean it. They, you know, comes back like a brand new bag. And you can't get that from synthetics. It just won't last as long. But I mean, you understand the principle of why the vapor barrier is important. It keeps the moisture out of your insulation. And evaporating moisture takes a fantastic amount. When you read the literature, you, you'll find it's like what you pass at night can melt umpteen pounds of ice on your chest, which is not a good idea. <laughs> You're welcome to come up here, take a look at the stuff, all over it. Ask questions more. You look at the stuff. Hey, so you, you have a lot of synthetic gear, but the main down you have is the down coat for the camps and the down bag. Apart from that, 
Yeah, wool also works excellent for clothing. Uh, if you're not allergic to it, it certainly is a good alternative. But as far as weight and compression, it can't be down. And now they've got some of the new down that's been like waterproof and treated, where you can wash the down and wash some of that into it. Thank you. Actual workshop where we go out in the field, pick up a map, disregard the part of the bottom of the meeting and carpooling there. Uh, you can work with Dave to set up some way of carpooling or that, and get a hold of him to let him know what equipment you've got. Can you share it with somebody, etc.? And we'll meet at nine o'clock up at my place up in Canadice, and then we'll hike into Harriet Hollister Spencer Park, spend a good part of the day there, and then come back to my place to set up camp, cook. And afterwards, you want to visit the cabin or whatever, we can do that or go for a night hike, depends on what you want to do. And if you want to stay on to Sunday, have lunch there, go over, ski in the park, they've got wonderful green trails. 